What I would like to try to do today is to give an overview of about 20 years of work uh, and hopefully provoke a conversation about what is progress and what is the future. So I begin with this staircase, which is designed by the son of an immigrant from Valencia, Spain, who comes to the United States about 140 years ago. And he has an elementary school education. And he builds this three-dimensional spiral staircase with no computer models and with no fancy university degree. And yet uh, the complex curvature is created entirely out of simple flat elements. And all of the tolerance is taken in the mortar joint which can move in three dimensions. And this staircase is supporting, of course, generations of, of people walking on top of it. In fact, it's in the Civil Engineering Building at uh, Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. And it was completed in 1914. This staircase has no steel in it. It's about uh, 10 centimeters thick. So it's a very thin shell. It's a brittle shell made of ceramic. You can think of it almost like an egg shell. And it works only in compression, primarily in compression, we could say. And despite the fact that it's in a civil engineering building, no engineer who's graduating from that program could calculate the load capacity of this staircase. And furthermore, no building code would allow you to build this staircase. And in the 1970s and 1980s, as concrete tall buildings were going up in Barcelona, they used this same staircase method because it was faster, cheaper, and more beautiful. And then eventually uh, the building authority said, oh no, you cannot build with this without steel. Um, this, this doesn't work, it's not in the building code. And of course, these stairs had been built for a thousand years. And, uh, and so I would ask the very simple question, are we at the pinnacle of all time? Obviously no. And furthermore, we have a lot to learn from history and we need to question our notions of progress uh, going forward because maybe something simple that doesn't have energy intensive materials like steel and minimal uh, minimizing cement, Portland cement, is a, is a better way to build. So I will try to give you uh, an overview of our research and in particular focusing on the um, on the possibilities in traditional masonry construction. So my work really covers three broad areas, the history of construction, the uh, preservation of historic structures, and then of course, architectural design. And this staircase for me really encompasses all three because you can ask the very simple question, how did this staircase land in Pittsburgh in 1914? How can we preserve it for the future and prove that it is stable? And furthermore, if this was possible a hundred years ago with no computers, what is possible? What else is possible? What other forms could be invented? So <clears throat> my own inspiration for this came during my PhD at Cambridge University when uh, I was at King's College with this 500 year old fault in stone. And you see it's held in place only by compression it has a complex geometry. Again, it was designed with uh, no computers, of course, and with very simple means of, of representing the geometry. But if you look at the upper side of such a fan vault, you can see there's quite a complex system of registering horizontal levels of interlocking stones, which uh, in a sense are almost prefabricated uh, by the masons in order to achieve this complex geometry. And if we laser scan this vault at King's College Chapel on the bottom, you can see again, it's only about 10 centimeters thick. And at the center line, it is fairly flat as an arch. So it's really working as a three-dimensional shell in compression. And this was so inspirational to me as a doctoral student when I stood on top of it. And of course, it's even more exciting because as the vault pushed against the walls, the walls leaned outward and cracks formed over the windows in the vault, which are about 10 centimeters wide. And you can look down through the cracks uh, 25 meters down to the floor below. And yet it's been there for 500 years. And so this inspires us to try to understand how a cracked 
brittle shell could be standing for centuries. And then, of course, think about what else is possible. And <clears throat> our challenge working in the built environment today is that the United Nations is projecting 100 million people per decade moving to urban areas, of course, mostly in the global south. But this is the equivalent of an additional population of the city of Chicago every two weeks for the next 30 years. The pandemic may slow this migration to urban areas, but ultimately these are the engines of economic growth and people are moving to cities. And how are we going to house uh, safely another 100 million people per decade while we limit CO2 emissions? Because we're now at the highest levels ever and shockingly, even over the last year, as all of us took a break from flying and from uh, many other carbon emitting activities, we still reach new highs, 420 parts per million of CO2 concentration. So this is a major, major challenge for uh, the coming decades. And <clears throat> as you might imagine, this is not what I think the future looks like. Uh, <clears throat> energy intensive materials assembled in a frivolous and expensive way. And, uh, you know, we are really at a point where, um, you know, frankly, there's just so much more that needs to be done. And, and all over the world, we are inspired by Greta Thunberg. My own family is eating much less meat because of her. My children have completely given up meat. And uh, so, so we're all inspired by uh, young people from, from the Baltic states who have ideas about what can be done in the future. So <clears throat> how do we get there? Uh, at the Venice Biennale five years ago, we proposed uh, efficient floor systems that were vaulted, taking inspiration from historical precedents, working with the master mason from Valencia, Spain, Salva Gomis, and, uh, and building simple floor systems out of either fired brick or earth uh, construction, so stabilized earth bricks. And this takes inspiration from Guastavino vaulted floors, which before the rise of uh, flat slabs and concrete were used as doubly curved shells with very high load capacity. And here we see Salva building the earthen brick floor system. And so it's certainly possible for small spans, five meters, uh, even 10 meters, to, uh, to work with unreinforced stabilized earth or even unstabilized earth and bricks if you get the geometry right so that it's working uh, as a structure. The other thing we must think about are materials. And this of course is a close up view of Roman concrete where we see bits of waste material, broken, uh, broken bits of uh, brick and pumice stone from construction sites mixed with volcanic ash. So very local material that can be tuned uh, and that is not energy intensive. And so uh, I will share some examples from history, in particular the fact that the Pantheon in Rome is using Roman concrete with different densities and a much lighter concrete at the top to lighten the weight of the dome uh, and to uh, reduce the thrust on the supports. And the Pantheon, of course, is one of the greatest buildings of all time. And uh, I hope you've all had a chance to go and see it and that you will uh, soon if you haven't. What you won't see when you're there is the fact that there are very large radial cracks coming up through the dome of the Pantheon. Um, and that if we look at the exterior, we see uh, brick, including embedded brick arches, which help to transfer loads over the niches and the interior drum. And you see a, a quite thick dome in this cast concrete, but over time, the walls leaned outward, the dome cracked, and the, the cracks were last seen in these photos in the 1930s, but you can see very large radial cracking and the Pantheon is perfectly stable. And the next time there's a moderate earthquake in Rome or a big earthquake, the cracks will reappear. The Pantheon will not fall down. Uh, people will uh, say we must save the Pantheon with new materials like uh, carbon fiber or uh, other materials that will last a long time and are high tech as a way of saving this. No, we must study history and know that the cracks have been there for nearly 2000 years 
and that the building is perfectly safe as a series of arches leaning in toward the center. And so I've had a series of students uh, studying the Pantheon structure, uh, building three-dimensional models, and then proving the stability with 3D printed models. This is a one to 100 scale model of the Pantheon. And with these scale models, we can study the collapse modes of uh, compression only structures in masonry. And we've been able to prove that the Pantheon can withstand horizontal accelerations about four times higher than the largest expected earthquake in Rome. And so we use a combination of digital techniques and historical studies to demonstrate the safety of historical monuments and try to promote uh, more um, uh, timid uh, conservation methods, which is to say, don't do anything to the building. If it's been there for a long time, sure, keep the water out, but don't add new materials and, um, and above all, don't add reinforced concrete in the name of saving historical structures. So I take inspiration from the oldest arch I know. This is the uh, Ramses II Mortuary Temple at Luxor uh, from about 1200 years uh, before the Common Era. And this is a very special series of vaults because they're built entirely out of earth in a pitched brick vault. But what's, what makes them extraordinary is that they're built with no formwork, with no centering. So, so in a region with minimal timber, to build a timber scaffolding to support the arch during construction is too complex. And so uh, ancient Egyptian builders, and particularly the ancient Nubian culture, this is known as a Nubian vault, were able to build long lasting durable structures from local earth that is sun, sun baked essentially. And so, you know, we think often that the Romans invented the arch, of course, that's not true. Uh, the Egyptians and even the Greeks knew of the arch, but a typical Roman vault was often built on formwork or centering like you see on the left, but the pitched brick vault, the Nubian vault, by leaning the bricks into three-dimensional space, each brick is stable as, as it leans by virtue of capillary action in the mortar, which is hold, preventing the brick from falling. And, but we've also been inspired by this idea of how you can build complex masonry structures with minimal formwork, because the staircases I showed you at the beginning, that is a, a method of tile vaulting that comes from Islamic culture from North Africa uh, up through the Iberian Peninsula about a thousand years ago. And again, it's built with no formwork. And so this for us is particularly exciting. In this case, using a flat brick uh, laid flat with the thin edges joined in a fast setting mortar, like a gypsum mortar or a plaster of Paris, a single brick can cantilever out into space held on two edges. And then as soon as the arch is complete, the structure is stable as an arch. So we ask ourselves, how can you find geometries that are possible to build so that they're stable at every stage of construction? And so here we see a a doubly curved simple vault being filled in. And I have a short video of this, which you can find on YouTube um, by a former student, Michael Ramage. And what you see is we use a formwork only for the edge arches, but you could build out from walls if you have walls, like in the case of a stair, you're building from walls. You don't need to build formwork at all. You can guide it only with strings. And here we use the simple wooden guides in the center to help uh, show us where the vault needs to go. And then intersecting barrel vaults are rising and closing toward the center with a fast setting mortar. This is less than two centimeters thick. It has no steel. It's built in a day. It's a brittle material and it has a very high load capacity because of the geometry, because of the double curvature, which is similar to an eggshell and that you can find multiple load paths uh, through the double curvature. And so this inspires us to ask what is possible. And this system of construction of tile vaulting was developed and extended by the family of immigrants I mentioned earlier, the Guastavino family, who built more than a thousand buildings across North America about a century ago. 
And in each of these buildings, they often built dozens and dozens of vaults. So they built tens of thousands of structural tile vaults with uh, minimal steel reinforcing and, uh, and were able to safely build structures out of, out of uh, essentially a very simple uh, ceramic brick. So this is Guastavino Sr., Rafael Guastavino in 1889, standing on the arch of the Boston Public Library under construction. And here we see that room uh, completed. And uh, because of 20 years of research, this room has now recently been renamed the Guastavino Room. Uh, in deference to the builders whose names are not on the buildings that, um, that we have been studying because they were hired by leading architects and they were trusted to create not only the interior finishes but also the structure and the color schemes working closely with the architects. And so for this building, they built seven different kinds of vaulting and they have um, maybe only about 12 drawings to do the whole project. And uh, this is a really interesting concept for me of, of really trusting a builder to do something special and, and helping to uh, develop and empower building contractors during the process. And so in some ways, the Guastavinos are a model for us. This is New York City's first underground subway station. Again, complex double curvature in uh, three dimensions with a pattern in a colorful ceramic tile. And these are structural vaults, but they've been abandoned for 60 years. And so many members of the public don't know about this project. And, um, and yet hopefully someday it can be reborn through an adaptive reuse. Right now trains do pass through it. Um, or this example of a dome in the Bronx Zoo. And uh, they're very carefully working with the ceramic tile to develop patterns, but they're also trying to cover a doubly curved surface with a flat tile, which does not work, and even with the tolerance in the joint. So they introduced the horizontal bands to take out the tolerance and to allow for the double curvature, essentially to reset the brick pattern, the herringbone brick pattern, in order to achieve the double curvature. So there's, there's deep, deep intelligence, even in the pattern here of the brick, which we may think is only decorative, but it's taken me many years to understand that in fact, it was a, a constructive process to understand um, how to achieve the curvature. So this is the, the father on the left and the son also named Rafael on the right who took over the company when the father died in 1908. And perhaps their greatest achievement in terms of structure was a, uh, although the staircase is still my personal favorite and is on the cover of my book, but the dome of St. John the Divine in New York City it's a dome that uh, had four large arches and they were trying to find a way to close it. And like Brunelleschi's dome in Florence, Guastavino Jr. said, well, I think we can do this with no support from below. And the Masons laid the brick in concentric rings and they were supported on the bricks that they had laid the day before. So here we see construction photos of St. John the Divine. It was built in only 14 weeks with no formwork. It's a tremendous feat of construction and um, it was designed to be only temporary, but it's been there now for uh, more than a century. And if we look at it in profile compared to the Pantheon in Rome, the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul or Brunelleschi's dome, we see that it's incredibly thin. Again, it's about 10 centimeters thick, but it's a similar scale and, uh, and was built much more quickly, obviously. And so, again, we're inspired by what these builders were able to achieve uh, without computers. And that's a view of the dome more recently. They were also um, often building quite flat floor systems. So this is a large auditorium with a very shallow dome. And here you can begin to see how the tiles in three dimensions are uh, giving small bits of movement from one to the next in order to achieve the curvature. And then the tolerance is taken up with the mortar joint. And in fact, they used an extruded mortar joint on the exterior to cover that change in curvature that's happening and also as a decorative effect. And so um, those were very interesting constructive as well as aesthetic ideas that the Guastavino company developed over time. Or another favorite is the Oyster Bar and Grand Central Terminal in New York. And um, the next time 
you get to go to New York, I recommend you sit on one of these stools and have a nice cold beer and some oysters and, uh, and think about those three dimensional curves, which are supporting all of the commuters every day in the train station above uh, through the double curvature without steel reinforcing. And of course, Ellis Island, uh, you can tell from my name that I have German heritage, uh, actually from uh, West Pomerania in, in Northern, what is that, in Germany. But I also have uh, immigrant grandparents who came from Italy and when they arrived in the US 100 years ago, they arrived under this vault at Ellis Island built by the Guastavino family who were themselves immigrants. And until recently, their story wasn't well known or appreciated here, even at Ellis Island. And this building was abandoned for 40 years and the tiles, the tile, structural tile vaults were in excellent condition after being uh, completely abandoned. So over the last uh, 20 years at MIT, we've been uh, doing research on their work to identify existing buildings. We found about 600 existing buildings and we're trying to prevent them from being torn down. And uh, we're also raising public awareness about them through uh, exhibitions. But this system of Guastavino tile vaulting was not used only by the Guastavinos. Uh, it's, uh, it was very common all throughout Europe. And in fact, we're even learning more recently at a conference at the VUB in Brussels that it was quite widespread uh, in Belgium, in Germany, also uh, at the same time the Guastavinos were working because you could achieve compound uh, curvature in a very simple means through construction. And here we see a project by Corbusier where the tile vault with only a single degree of curvature is used as a lost formwork for concrete. But this has always fired my imagination because the stair at the beginning that I showed you is an example of how one way that we could build complex forms more simply with the first layer being built in the Guastavino style, perhaps with larger tiles, and then uh, casting additional mortar or concrete on top of that in, in the way that Corb has done here. Although you could do it uh, with much less material and make much lighter structures, which is what they're doing in completing the uh, Sagrada Familia. Here we see the vaults in the central nave of the Sagrada Familia, which are using hyperbolic paraboloids, but using the thin tile to achieve the complex geometry. And, um, and this is the result out of uh, the ceramics. I'm sorry to say that they're reinforcing them with steel because they don't trust the, the masonry without steel. And that's a common struggle for me to get engineers to understand that it's possible to build safe structures in compression without putting steel in them. And which brings us back to the vault at King's College Chapel, complex geometry, uh, in fact, negative Gaussian curvature, uh, opposite degrees of curvature in these fan vaults and, uh, and no steel. So held in place only by compression. And one particularly important doctoral student of mine, Philippe Bloch, who now runs a very active group at ETH, many of you likely know, uh, in pondering how such structures work, that helped lead to his work in developing a thrust network analysis for his PhD, now commonly implemented in RhinoVault, which allows you to explore uh, complex geometry uh, like you see here. Um, and um, <clears throat> the thrust network method basically creates and explores the equilibrium of essentially three-dimensional networks of forces that are working only in compression or only in tension. You can, of course, add the possibility of some tension or some compression as well, but it's both a form-finding method and a structural analysis method, and it allows us, for example, to begin to demonstrate how complex spiral staircases like this can work in pure compression with no, uh, with no steel required, only sound supports on the sides to resist the compression. And we of course know this from uh, the English scientist, Robert Hooke, who invents the concept of the hanging chain, that if you find a form in tension hanging under a given set of loads, typically say self-weight, it hangs as a catenary, if you could freeze it and invert it, it would be the ideal shape in compression. 
And so uh, Hooke's concept is very powerful for assessing historic structures, but such as the uh, Dome of St. Peter's uh, in Rome, uh, but it also is very useful for design. And so we can use this idea <clears throat> here seen uh, implemented in graphic statics to show equilibrium of a two-dimensional arch, random polygonal arch where the weights of each individual stone are represented as hanging on the flexible line below. But if you could freeze that and invert it, the vectors would be in equilibrium and compression. So <clears throat> the, for the rest of my lecture, I'd like to focus not on history, which is where we have, I have been speaking mostly, and I'd like to turn toward contemporary design. And uh, what I hope I've convinced you by uh, this brief ex series of examples in construction history as well in, as in preservation, that we have a lot to learn by studying history. And in particular, uh, for me, the um, the notion that there are forms in pure compression that can be built with humble materials like earth and brick, uh, as builders did uh, for millennia, should help inspire us to think about what other things are possible for the future. And oftentimes we as structural engineers are asked to optimize a poor design, or in other words, to make a bad design stand up. And this was a vault that I, stood under five times and I was always sketching it, taking photos. I could not understand how the structure was stable because it was a terrible geometry, a single degree of curvature that turned back on itself, terrible form. And then one day I turned on the news and I learned that it does not stand up. And this is of course the Charles de Gaulle airport terminal collapse that fortunately it happened at uh, about six o'clock in the morning and the terminal was empty and so uh, still five people lost their lives, uh, but it could have been much, much worse. And this was a 1 billion euro failure, but it also was years and years of planning to build a bad geometry with a single degree of curvature. And so there's a great, great danger in computational tools today that we generate forms in a gravity-free environment and, um, and then we throw as much steel or cement as we need to at the structure in order to make it stand up. But if you have a bad form, um, you know, even this on a calm day, it collapsed much less. Uh, if we think about the shells of um, Pier Luigi Nervi, for example, that were bombed in uh, World War II, but, uh, but survived the bombs because of their double curvature and their inherent uh, stability. And if we look at this Charles de Gaulle example and we look at Hook's hanging chain, you can see the geometry is very far away from Hook's hanging chain. No problem, you can uh, stiffen it or, or strengthen it through form, uh, but here we have only single degree of curvature. And uh, so this was a great tragedy. And also in the profession, we have many analysis tools, but very few design tools for structure. And so for uh, over the last decade, we've really been working on developing design tools, uh, and in particular, my uh, former student, Caitlin Mueller, who runs a digital structures lab at MIT, is really pushing design tools uh, digitally, which is quite exciting for structure. But I do go back to history and graphic statics, which is often seen as a 19th century method. I think of it as a 25th century method. Here we see the inclined uh, arcade on the left by Gaudí in the part Guel, which is deeply rational. It's a stone arch which is supporting the thrust of the earth and the embankment, and the geometry is derived in order to act in pure compression. So it's a graphic statics is a generative method to build a structure around the forces that are acting the way that Robert Maillard did uh, for the Saudi Natobo Bridge. And so implementing this in three dimensions um, gives us many new possibilities. So I'll just show you a few projects and then hopefully we'll have time for discussion and I'd be very interested in your comments or questions. And I have a few questions for you as well. Um, so the first project, uh, it wasn't our first built project, but it's quite an important project for us, was in South Africa. Uh, National Park Service was looking to build a museum, a visitor center with local materials and local labor, passive energy strategies as part of a poverty relief program to really maximize 
local resources, both human and material. And architect Peter Rich uh, came to MIT and we worked together and he developed a simple concept of here you see a catenary form arch acting in pure compression, but then with double curvature to stiffen the arch and the vaults against live load and using them as part of the passive uh, design strategy. We developed a compressed earth block stabilized by 7% uh, cement uh, to create a relatively weak brick, but it has um, much less imported material than if we had been building uh, in traditional concrete. And uh, we developed these doubly curved forms with uh, minimal to no steel and, uh, and trained local workers to build arches using the Guastavino technique or the uh, Islamic tile vault. And, so here you see the earthen bricks cantilevering out into space with a fast setting mortar. But as soon as the arch is complete because of the, the arching action, they are stable and the wooden guides are there to guide the geometry, but, um, but not to support the shell during construction. So this is a, a doubly curved, uh, unreinforced earth shell, which is made out of very weak soil. Uh, but uses uh, local materials. And uh, here's one of the longer vaults that we did. And then we also used it as lost formwork for concrete, as you see there on the bottom, because importing plywood or formwork for concrete would have been very expensive. And so we used the earthen shells to, uh, to form the concrete slabs, shells and domes. So we built a whole series of geometries at uh, Mapungubwe. Uh, for this project with Peter Rich Architects and our South African collaborators. And, um, and you know, this was a quite important early project for us because it demonstrated how you could uh, take the traditional technique of the Guastavino company and adapt it in a local context for a new architecture. And to our huge surprise in 2009 out of 700 entries, this was named World Building of the Year at the World Architecture Festival. So it shows that great invention can occur with the constraints in this case of uh, trying to do low cost local construction out of earth that can also be inspirational and uh, beautiful in my opinion, but I'm perhaps biased. That project led in part to another collaboration with architect Norman Foster uh, envisioned as a series of drone ports uh, for Rwanda and uh, we were able to demonstrate this also at the Venice Biennale of Architecture in 2016. And uh, here working together with our colleagues at ETH and Philippe Bloch and his research group, as well as uh, Matt DeYoung, uh, who's now at Berkeley, but had been at Cambridge, we were able to develop a simple double curve geometry using elastic splines. These are fiberglass rods on a grid of one to two meters. And by fixing the height as well as the curvature, we're able to create a complex geometry and use that, um, use that to uh, create this form, which would be quite difficult to build out of formwork, but with the tile vaulting technique, you can build out into open space only from the edges. Um, and thank you for your questions that are coming and maybe we can address those at the end. Um, so it was important for us to demonstrate both the built vault as well as the process of building. So we left the formwork up on the right, on the left, as part of the permanent installation at the Biennale. And uh, this was built by uh, two architecture students uh, from Puerto Rico, Luis Salzayas and Sisto Cordero, together with Master Mason from Mad Madrid, Spain, Carlos Martin, and this has been a hallmark of our projects that we try to bring together skilled masons with digitally savvy students of architecture and engineering and working together on site, we're able to create these complex projects, which neither the team could do on their own. So these projects are simply not possible without bringing a master craftsman together with a digital architect. And we also collaborated with Santiago Huerta and the Polytechnic University of Madrid to build a half scale model and load test it to convince the Italian authorities that the unreinforced shell would be safe. And here we are at the completed vault with the construction team and Norman Foster 
and the vision of how these vaults could expand. This was meant to be temporary, but it stayed up for three years. So it got rained on and snowed on and it didn't have good waterproofing. So I was actually quite relieved when they tore it down uh, one year ago. And um, I'll show you a demolition where <clears throat> by removing only one support, normally for a, a well-built vault, if you remove one support, maybe that quadrant will collapse, but the rest of it will stay standing. But here you can see the whole vault collapsed because in part it had had quite a bit of weathering over time. And um, this again was made of earth. So <clears throat> let's talk about carbon for a minute. We all need to have literacy in carbon. And uh, my former student, Catherine de Wolf, another Belgian student who's now a professor at uh, ETH in Zurich, she has worked quite a lot on embodied carbon and structures and has demonstrated, for example, that the bird's nest in Beijing have 1,300 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per square meter. It's, of course, a digitally built, very inefficient uh, steel structure working primarily as cantilevers. And the London Olympic Stadium, four years later, has one-fifth of that. In other words, carbon intensity. In other words, you could build five London Olympic stadiums for the same carbon emissions as one bird's nest. And so this shows us what is possible through good engineering, but that's still working with energy intensive materials of uh, steel and concrete, whereas our Mapungubwe project in South Africa is one fourth again. So you could build four of those for the same carbon intensity of the London Olympic Stadium. Now, of course, achieving very large spans in Earth is difficult, but uh, it gives you a sense of the literacy we need around carbon that, you know, 100 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per square meter is pretty good. And, but where we really need to get to is our built environment as a carbon sink, the way a forest is. And how do we find ways to uh, create structures and materials that are absorbing carbon and so that as we build, uh, shelter for uh, future inhabitants of spaceship Earth, we're able to find ways to bring our planet's uh, carbon cycle back into balance. I'll just finish with two last projects. This is a very important project for me. Uh, this was on the campus of MIT. The uh, campus police officer who was killed by the Boston Marathon bombers um, in 2013 uh, my colleague Mi Jin Yoon was asked to develop a memorial and she developed a concept in uh, granite that would be uh, five intersecting walls with an open vault in the middle. And um, our design team consisting of many uh, students and researchers in engineering and architecture developed a very simple approach of half arches leaning in on each other using graphic statics to demonstrate the stability of each leg of the granite structure. And then using Rhino, we were able to empower the design team to explore hundreds of possible geometries, but only geometries that would be stable by having arches that are leaning in on each other in the center. And then by creating, uh, discretizing the stones so that the, the cuts would be perpendicular to the dominant compressive force. And so that allowed us to begin to chop up the, the, the mass into a series of granite stones and, um, and then we're using 3D printing. These are also structural models that check the stability, uh, not only during construction. And I wanna stay on this just for a moment because you see the way this was built. It's using uh, the keystone in the center is being placed last. And therefore all of the precision, all of the tolerance is pushed toward the middle and the middle sags a little bit. The way we actually built it was we put the keystone in first and then we built the stones in the center around it so that all of the tolerance and error was pushed into the five walls which could land wherever they wanted to land but then the vault in the middle was very, um, was very tight and had minimal movement. This was fabricated of course with digital fabrication by Quora Stone uh, using robotic milling and uh, getting perhaps one millimeter accuracy. But of course, we can never be perfectly precise. There's always error. So we have to build that error into our construction process as well as our design. And here the stone, the keystone on the left is being fitted with the stones around it. And that winter we got three meters of snow, which you can appreciate is difficult to build something with so much snow around. 
Um, and uh, we built the entire thing on scaffolding and uh, the engineer of record was not me, uh, but it was on my university campus. So I was very keen for it to work, but the engineer of record was not comfortable with this working in compression only. So they insisted on including steel bars uh, that would um, have the capacity to transfer tension. And um, this was a very fast project. And uh, ultimately I was able to convince them to reduce the number of steel pins, but I'm still not happy that the pins are there because over time they could cause fracture. But we did, we turned this into a large science experiment where the pins were all grouted on one side only and were loose in the stones. And then we lowered the scaffolding. And when you lower the scaffolding, uh, we put each leg of the scaffolding on a large scale, like a bathroom scale, five ton bathroom scale, that would register the force in the scaffolding. And as we lowered it, if the force goes down, that means we're developing arching action. And, um, and immediately we developed arching action. We were able to transfer almost all of the load into arching. And this is after the scaffolding was removed and it's standing as, an, as a vault in compression. And then we grouted the, um, the rods uh, uh, so that they're acting, but uh, not acting, not carrying tension under dead load. And here we are as the project opens, uh, built with Mi Jin Yoon and Eric Howler. Um, and this was the builder. This was the stone mason who was installing the stones, Bob Asmar. He was a very serious guy. And one day he called me on my mobile and said, um, hey, I got a new license plate for my truck. And I said, oh yeah, Bob, what did you get? And he said, well, I decided to, uh, to go with equilibrium because I was always uh, pushing for equilibrium as uh, the basic principle that allowed the structure to stand, even if an elastic finite element model said that you needed tension and therefore you needed steel. And uh, so then I'll just very quickly finish with our final project at the Venice Biennale, and you can find lectures on this or learn more from Philippe Bloch, who really drove the construction of the Armadillo Vault um, with his group, uh, the Bloch Research Group in Zurich. But we were invited by Alejandro Aravena to demonstrate our war against bending, the notion that architectural structures must work in bending with lots of steel to carry the tension and uh, together with Matt DeYoung, who's an expert in dynamics and earthquake engineering. So we had to produce a two page sketch uh, and we proposed a very large freeform stone vault as well as these floor prototypes that would be lighter weight systems and floor for floors I showed you earlier in earth or uh, Philippe's group developed uh, very exciting digitally fabricated uh, on the left in concrete and on the right uh, 3D printed in sand um, complex geometries, which are 70% lighter than conventional floor slabs in concrete, and I think more beautiful as well. So this is a very exciting frontier, floor slabs to reduce weight and carbon emissions. And I'm going to, you can find a lot of material about the armadillo vault online, but the most important demonstration of the concept of equilibrium and compression is the armadillo vault using stone, uh, which with cut marks from the saw on the interior, which were broken off so that each stone could be digitally fabricated in only 45 minutes and then left flat on the top. So the stones did not have to be flipped over because then you lose precision when you flip them. So by milling each stone on the flat side on the back that allowed the fabricator to achieve high precision in the milling and in the construction. And so following the Collier project where we were forced to put steel pins in the structure, this project, it was important for us to show that you could do thinner, more complex geometries uh, with no steel pins. And so here you see uh, down to about uh, eight centimeters thickness in stone held in place only by compression through complex curvature. And Aravena arrived on site and he was immediately interested in this complex geometry achieved with very simple means of single flat pieces of stone that are milled. And before we knew it, he climbed up on top of the vault and he said to the father-son team, the Escobedo family who helped to build it, um, I look at this and I understand everything. He said, and then I understand nothing. And so this project for us is both incredibly uh, complex, 
but it's also incredibly simple. It's 400 pieces of flat stone held in place only by compression. And this is our tribute to the King's College fan vault that was done by builders 500 years ago without digital fabrication, without computers, and without fancy university degrees like we have. So uh, that's what we wanted to demonstrate with the Armadillo Vault. And then finally, uh, what's very exciting for me is that some of the tools and ideas we've been developing are being implemented by other designers around the world with no input at all from us. So this is a recent project in Southern India for a school library where using tile vaulting and using Rhino Vault to find the geometry a group of young architects were able to create a form that acts in compression made of local bricks uh, and a vaulted surface that can also be walked on. And, you know, the scale of the problems that we're facing in the world, in universities, we need to find a way to get our research out into the world and not only to sit on the shelf in a digital PDF. So I'll close with three ideas. The history of construction is fertile ground for us as designers. We must use a structural imperative to discover new forms, to build more efficiently with lower uh, carbon emissions. But if we really want to go to ultra low carbon, we must explore traditional materials of timber and local earth uh, that have the potential to dramatically reduce carbon emissions. And the only way to do that is to work closely with builders and, and craftspeople who, are, who know the materials well and, and design together. So uh, although I've presented this as my work, this is the work of, a, of a generations of students as well. And so I just want to acknowledge those students who've helped to make all this possible. And, uh, and I'm very grateful to them. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, John. And I think we should give John a big hand. <laughs> So, uh, there are uh, at least one question, and uh, I also have uh, some questions uh, in my, that's possible, but, but we begin with eagles, uh, uh, because um, this is, uh, the precision of the geometry is so important. Uh, uh, now as well as, as in the history uh, and uh, if we uh, think of, of our uh, measuring tools 3d scans of, of different kinds uh, how have you used uh, this measurement uh, is it uh, mainly to to um, uh, analyze existing buildings or uh, are there also a development in, in, uh, the, in regarding the, uh, the erection process? Well, that's a wonderful question. Thank you. I, um, we have used uh, 3D scanning and, and point clouds, uh, photogrammetry to some extent, almost exclusively for studying and analyzing existing buildings. Um, however, your suggestion is a very good one that there is, there's great potential uh, for new construction where geometry is really important. So if we're trying to build an unreinforced vaulted staircase, for example, if you lose the curvature locally, you don't have a safe structure. So, um, so I think what you're suggesting is quite interesting that we could use almost real time geometry assessment through 3D scanning or other means to try to make sure the masons know where they're placing the bricks that we have a stable equilibrium. And so uh, I'll think about that and I'll try to credit you if we do it on a future project. But I, I think that's a very interesting idea because now we have the potential to carefully monitor a geometry during construction, which is if, if it wasn't clear, some of these projects, we are out on the edge. Some of these projects, I lie awake at night thinking, hmm, is that gonna work? <laughs> and I, in some ways you have a, a kinship with builders throughout history because they were also lying awake at night thinking, wow, 
you know, can I use a flying buttress? Do I need that material in the wall? Can I take it away and only have a flying buttress? Um, so, so yes, this would help me sleep at night, perhaps, to have better control of geometry. Thank you. And, and thank you, John, and thank you, Eagles, uh, for the question. Uh, are there other questions? Uh, while waiting, uh, I have one of my own. Uh, yeah. uh, you um, uh, talk about the importance of, of low carbon materials. And, and uh, you also shown your, your examples from South Africa, for, for example, where, where you uh, try to um, uh, use what material you have at hand and, and also uh, how to uh, make, uh, make them stiff enough. Or, or, um, uh, so how do you think of, of, of the use in terms of, I know that some of the students here are thinking of, on, on the PhD students are thinking of cir circular use of materials. And, and if we uh, bring in other materials in, into uh, uh, this concept, uh, uh, how do you think of, of, of uh, the local material properties, the stiffness, the weakness, uh, the, the brittleness, etc.? Uh, it's, it's a very good question. I mean, we, we must ensure that we are building safely. And that is what the building codes do for us when they say your concrete must have a certain strength, must have a certain ability to limit the width of the cracking, you know, to protect the steel. Um, so the materials are incredibly important. And yet my research group has not done a lot of work with materials because we see so much potential in form and geometry, you know, like the Charles de Gaulle example, because we are using digital tools to make crazy geometries, and then we throw sophisticated materials to help them stand up. You know, my group has almost been focusing on the opposite. Let's um, pretend that we have very weak and poor materials, and let's try to find geometries that would work for them. Uh, but you, you raise a very good point that one of our challenges is proving the safety of existing or locally available or weaker materials that are not in the building code. You know, for example, you can find earthen walls all over Europe. Some have been standing for centuries, but building codes won't let you have an earthen wall which is supporting the weight of a floor above. And yet it's been done for centuries. So. I do think this needs more university research and laboratory testing. We built a, an earthen wall on our campus 15 years ago, and we've been monitoring its performance in snow and rain and wind to see it's eroding, it's losing material over time, but we're, we're studying it in a long-term study. So that's quite interesting, thank you. I guess, yes, uh, thank you, John. And, uh, Yes, Pedro and um, uh, Ivo have, have asked a question. Maybe Pedro, you can ask a question uh, your, uh, yourself if uh, Emilia let Pedro in. Sure. C can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. All right. Nice to meet you, John. Pedro Abel uh, from Finland. Um, so I'd, the question would be, how much is known from the training of the Masons from the Guastavino time? And uh, I asked this also to know how was the training done, if you know about it. How often also did these structures fail in, because it, yeah. there was no calculation? And then following that, if you can memorize, um, was the training of such masons so tough, so difficult that the technology made them too expensive? Yeah, thank you, Pedro. Those are wonderful questions. Um, the archives are not complete, but what we do know is that the company was able to build projects by having a master mason who would go city to city and then would hire local masons, bricklayers essentially, and train them. So the high, there would be different tiers of skill level among the masonry team, which you also saw in medieval cathedrals, for example. Um, but uh, I'm very happy to say that although they built tens of thousands of vaults, not one never one single collapse ever occurred. No structural failure ever. 
And today in the United States, we have many engineers who are arriving, they look at them and they say, hmm, I don't like this. And so they put reinforced concrete on top or they put carbon fiber on it um, and that's going to cause more problems over time. So there was never one structural failure, extremely impressive. If we look at the great builders like Felix Candela, um, they often have a failure and you learn from the failure. I have had some things fall down and failures. I'll tell you about those in another lecture, but you learn more from your failures and collapses. Um, and then finally, uh, I think the system went out of use in part because the cost of labor went up for the masons. And so it became more expensive, but also because of the rise of reinforced concrete, of building codes and of modern architecture that said, everything must be straight and minimal and these, we don't want these complex curves. And so we had a kind of ideology of progress that a brick compound curve was something from the past and sleek and flat concrete represents the future. So uh, I found examples where they were less expensive than concrete shells, but the client built the concrete shell because that represented the future. So we can call that progress ideology. That somehow we neglect something that's historical because it somehow doesn't fit our notion of progress. No, thank, you, thank you, Thank you. Thank uh, you. And then we have a question from uh, Yang Mu uh, that I know is thinking in, in uh, parallel terms. So, so please, Yang Mu, can, uh, can you ask your question? Um, and Amelia, if you open for, hmm. for Yang Mu. I also, I'm reading it, but please no, go ahead. I, I gave him now the right to, uh, he's now unmuted. Yeah, thanks, thanks, John. You have a very, very nice uh, presentation for us. And I also read your book about the, the structural tile. It was very nice. So I have a question uh, about the material because uh, we know the mastery is, is more like in compression. So we know the material properties of this type of material, but Today we're talking about some salvaged material, which means we have more complexity in the material properties and also the material dimensions. So how to solve it by using or selecting different structures? Well, thank you very much. I, I think that's really important. Um, thank you also for reading my book. I think my own parents didn't read the book, so I'm very grateful to you. <laughs> um, you know, First of all, I think it's always must be some combination of simplicity and complexity, right? So the Guastavinos achieve complex geometry with very simple means, and it's all about the mortar joint. So perhaps we can take a clue from that. If you have existing elements that you want to use, maybe you use those existing elements, but then you design something, um, something more complex and customized to allow the joining of existing elements safely. Or um, we find some way to bring the tolerance in there in the joints. I mean, that to me, I'm, for example, you could imagine laser scanning components, having them work in compression, but then 3D printing in concrete some very precise nodes that would allow them to join together in compression. Um, so that for me would be an example of how we could invent new possibilities with existing uh, structural components. I should also say that uh, the only way we've been able to build these projects is by bringing the building authorities and engineers along with us. And so we usually build a small scale model, we load test it, we get everyone's confidence in it, and then we build from there. So you need to bring the team along with you, which may mean doing uh, mechanical testing in the laboratory. And of course we can have very high loads, so that can be complicated, but even scale models can be useful. So that's a long answer, but I, I, it is exactly the kind of challenge we're facing because the idea that you could knock down a steel building, melt down the steel beams to make new steel beams, and then pat yourself on the back and say, ah, we have a recycled building, look how green we are. I mean, that is ridiculous. So we'd be much better off reusing structural components as structural components and not melting them down at high temperature and reforming them again. So thank you for that. What do you think, Carl? 
Uh, yes, uh, uh, I have. Uh, I know that Yang was working with wood, and and, and uh, we have been discussing. I, I think that uh, there is a difference between uh, uh, the compressed block and and uh, the wood piece that have both uh, compression and tension properties that gives another kind of, of, of uh, yeah. shape, yeah. Uh, architectural shaping possibilities. But, but, uh, so um, I think that Yangu could, could uh, bring uh, in, in his uh, PhD, uh, pick up a lot of, of what you have said, Herbert, trend, try to transfer it to his own material and, and, and his own uh, material element for blocks. Yeah, yeah. In wood, I, I think there are many possibilities to move away from the notion that we cut a dimensional piece of lumber from the center of the tree and we lose all this other material, right? So I, I think that's very, very interesting, especially working with existing elements. So I wish you luck with that. Um, thank you. I would leave you all with three thoughts about how we overcome progress ideology that we, you know, complex titanium may not be the future. It may be a simple rammed earth wall. How do we empower building contractors as equals in the design process? Because at least in the US and in many places I've worked in Europe, you have a real hierarchy that there's the university education and then there's a, a builder who uh, is somehow less than, and I personally am always learning from builders, and I encourage that we must find ways to, to embrace them as equals. And finally, building codes we know are stifling our creativity, but we do have to create safe structures for the public. And so, you know, that for me is a challenge when we're really doing things that are very far outside the building code. And so that's what I'm always thinking about. So I leave you with these questions. I want to say thank you to everyone for inviting me. And I also want to thank the organizers for not um, putting me across from the uh, Denmark-Belgium football match. And uh, I have something small for you here. Look at this. I wear this around <laughs> Cambridge, if you can believe it. This is Henrik Larsen. So okay. um, I wish all of you good luck and uh, please come see me if you're in Boston in the future. And I would love to learn about your projects in the future as well. We have a lot of important work to do in the built environment and uh, we're depending on all of your hard, hard work and your ideas. So good luck everyone and thank you again.